Hello! This video is going to demonstrate the steps that you'll need to perform to gather the information needed to perform the 12th step of the land fire evaluation process, or just set yourself up for doing some fire modeling in FlamMap. So uh, to begin, here's some resources that might be of interest to you. Uh, on sparkedresources.weebly.com, you can go to resources, how to, and you can find other how to information on the land fire evaluation process. And then there's also a page that will demonstrate um, the various steps that um, you can perform to really get to know your landscape and um, answer some uh, bigger picture management questions like fuel treatment effectiveness or fire hazard across a site. So you can find those resources there. So the first thing we need to do in uh, this 12th step is to identify a large fire that burned in an area that's similar to our project area. So perhaps you uh, were working in an area where large fires occur frequently. In that case, it will be pretty easy to choose one. Um, I'm working on Moscow Mountain, and there haven't been a lot of large fires that have occurred on Moscow Mountain, and not many that have occurred near it. So I'm um, left with trying to choose one that's nearby. So I've logged into this program called ITIDIS, Interagency Fuel Treatment Decision Support System, which is a really great resource to get a quick picture of the disturbances in the area. So in the Map Studio, I can click on Add Layers, and select disturbances for the last 10 years. I wouldn't want to choose any more than that since I wouldn't be able to reliably find the fire progression information for them and that's what I'll need to complete this process. So what I can do is uh, zoom into areas that are somewhat nearby and have a similar fuel type. So this um, is a complex down here. I can use my identify tool and click the area. And this helps me identify the name of the fire, which in this case is the Clearwater Complex. Clearwater Complex is kind of occurring in more of a drier area, so I'm looking around a little bit more and I might be more interested in a fire up here. And what I could do um, if I really wanted to make sure that this fire was matching the area and I wasn't very familiar with the landscape, I could go onto the um, land fire program and start to evaluate the, the fuel, fuel models for that area. For now though, so this looks like the Johnson Bar Fire. Um, I'm going to go with the Johnson Bar Fire to, to model my area. I do also have a fire that's up um, a little closer called the Strychnine Fire, um, and the that's a good representative fuel model there, but the uh, problem with the Strychnine Fire is that there aren't progression um, fire perimeters for that fire. It just grew very large in one day, so I wouldn't be able to model fire spread from a consecutive day. I may attempt to um, to model fire behavior from the ignition point, and we'll demonstrate both of these techniques. So to begin, um, I'm going to go to the landfire.gov site, and I'm going to go to the Get Data button. And I'm going to be going to the Data Distribution site, and zooming into my area. All right, so the first thing I will do is turn off the layer that's about to pop up here. Turn off my existing vegetation type layer so I can see my topographic layer. And I'll zoom in toward the Johnson Bar Fire. Now on landfire.gov, there is a layer for disturbance. And this will help me just make sure I'm downloading to the right location. So I can see um, some of these shadows that match what I'm seeing on the IFTDIS site. So you can see the same shape right there. So I know that this is the Johnson Bar Fire. And I'll turn that off. And the data that I'm going to be downloading, it's very important that since you're modeling fire from what had occurred, what, what from historic, you want to make sure that you're downloading the land fire data before this fire incident. If I downloaded land fire data that had already been corrected for this fire, then I'd be modeling like the fire had burned again in the same location, and that wouldn't um, provide any results that I would be that that would be usable. So um, I'm, I'm this fire occurred in 2014. I found that information out from the information option here in IFTDIS, and I can turn on uh, this data product, the 1.4 product, fire behavior fuel models, 40 fire behavior fuel models and I can start to look around at this area that burned, and I can see a shadow of the Johnson Bar Fire, so I know that this data have, uh, these data have been corrected already. So I'm gonna use the 2012 product and select 
this one just to be sure that it's not um, been corrected already for that, which it will not have been. So yep, indeed, they're showing that those are the pre-fire fuels. So now I'm going to go to the get or the download tool, and I'm going to turn off the default, which is on, and turn on the 2012 fuel, and I'm going to select the LCP, the landscape scale file. Often when I'm downloading landfire data for a project area, I'm downloading each individual piece of the landscape file because I would like to manipulate and look at them individually. In this case, all I'm looking for is the data to, to do fire modeling, which, which I need is all that I need is the, the landscape scale file. So I'm going to select that option. I'm going to click this draw box option, and I'm going to draw a box around the um, Johnson Bar fire. It's important to give it a little bit of a buffer um, you're going to be modeling fire spread, it might not model in the same direction that um, it burned in historically. So now I'll click the modify option. And if you want more information about um, downloading these individual layers from the Landfire um, site, you can see the Acquiring Landfire Data video. If I wanted to make any changes to the layers that I've selected, I can make that here. But all I'm interested in right now is the best fit UTM projection so that it um, alters the projection of the data that I'm downloading. And then click Save Changes and Return to Summary. And now I can click Download. And this will just take a couple minutes to download. So while this is finishing up, I'm going to um, now download my fire perimeter data for the Johnson Bar Fire. There are several places you can acquire perimeter data. So I'm going to go to GeoMac which is where I currently get my progression information. Uh, this might be changing as the GeoMax site is going to be closing soon, but uh, there will be a way for you to obtain fire perimeter information. So we go to download perimeters and 2014 data. You can check back um, on the documentation on Spark resources for updates as um, technology changes. So I'm going to go to Idaho and Johnson Bar Fire. And I'm going to, uh, these are these are each the shape files. This has all the different shape file pieces, and then it has this zip file. The zip file contains all these pieces, but of course in one file. I've got some date structure here, 2014, August 7th, and here's the time, 1430. And so what I'm looking for is, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly interested in uh, fires that have consecutive days growth. Since I'm trying to cue into uh, the weather that occurred on that day, what caused that growth to happen, I'll be looking up the weather in Fire Family Plus. So it's important that um, that we have lots of consecutive days of growth. In this case, I do seem to have um, good day-by-day uh, -day fire progression. So I'm going to go through and download all these zip files. Um, you may not need to download them all. I'm choosing two so that I can make sure that I get um, the best day to uh, model fire behavior with. All right, so it took a little while, but I downloaded each of those zip files. Hard to keep track of which one you're clicking on. So also at this point, my land fire data have finished downloaded. So I'm downloading. So I'm going to go and just select show in folder. And in my downloads folder, um, I'll see all these files that I've downloaded, including the LCP. So I'm just going to select all of these. Hold shift down, click the top one. Now I've got them all. And I'll select copy. And I'm going to move them into my project folder. Um, it's very important to make sure that your project folder is going to be no, have no spaces in it. So I'm moving this into my Moscow Mountain folder and we'll call it Johnson Bar. No spaces. Ooh, that was a close one. All right, so now I'm, um, I have all these zip files, and I am not going to need to unzip all of them. I'm just really interested in the day that I will plan on doing fire modeling. So to save a little bit of time, the system that um, of IFTDIS requires zip files in order to load an image in. So I'm just going to capitalize on that. Instead of unzipping everything and opening it up in ARC, I'm going to um, upload some shape files here. And I'll upload my fire perimeters into IFTDIS. And then I'll be able to see which day would be a good candidate for fire growth. And then I'll be able to look up the weather for, for that day. So 
All right, so you can start to see the fire progression of this of this fire here. All right, fast forward. All right, so now that I have um, mapped uh, several days of progression, I found that there is one day that stands out as a good candidate for doing fire spread. And it looks like um, it is the 12th of August. And so what I what makes it a good candidate is that it looks like there's maybe one primary um, front here. So as far as modeling, my plan would be to do an ignition line along this um, this day's fire progression and then have it burn, um, see if it can match this, this um, growth. If there's growth all around, like there were on some of the other days, that's harder to model because you're just modeling a whole circle of fire. So I look try and look for one day that grew in one direction, um, a significant amount, and then I try and match that. Um, so I'm going to be using the 12th of August. So now my job is to go and collect the weather data for this area. So I'll just do a quick demonstration of how to uh, get your weather data. Uh, so. I went to the WUFIS site, and this is all linked to in the How to Use Fire Family Plus document that's available on Sparked Resources. Um, so starting with the historical data, this is historically hourly, historical hourly weather data. And um, I'm looking for my area. You can see that here's a topographic feature that I can recognize from um, the IFTDIS page here with my fire. So I know that um, the RAW station that it's available is luckily um, right near my, my fire. So I would just need to click on this and select, um, click here to download the hourly weather data, and an FW13 file is downloaded. Uh, these other two weather stations would also be good to download. Uh, neither of them are available at this time, uh, but it's always good to have at least two weather stations near your fire so you can see how the weather varies depending on where you're at. So when I have that FW13 file downloaded, then I can go into Fire Family Plus, and I can select Data Import, and it imports that data um, I suggest that this um, FW13 file is saved to your project folder so you don't um, lose information. And then for my purposes, uh, so then of course you'll have to drop down and select the, ROS, the um, station there. And I'm interested in the weather on the 14th of, um, or the 12th of August 2014. So I've narrowed my, my um, working set down to 2014, changed it to August 12th. And um, again, the reason that um, I've chosen that date is that according to what I looked at with the IFTDIS perimeters, that the growth from the 11th to the 12th was um, a good subject for doing some fire modeling. Um, notice here on these naming schemes that this uh, time is pretty important. So um, for example, the 11th at 0249, this is representing growth from the 10th of August. The reason it's, it's, it's representing from the 10th is that it's taken in the middle of the night, and so uh, the perimeter on the middle in the middle of the night on the 11th would be um, from the growth on the 10th. But the reason that's important is that if I'm trying to pick up weather information for fire spread, I would want the information if I were to model for this day. I would want the information for the weather on the 10th. In this case, um, I'm at 2307, which is um, going to be representing the weather information or the growth information on the 12th, and so therefore I am picking up weather information from the 12th. Of August 2014 and now I can go to weather and hourly listing and what I'm looking for here are the variables that are going to be inputs for me so these are the ones I've always are all de already pulled over dry bulb relative humidity wind speed one hour ten hour hundred hour fill moistures herbaceous and woody fill moistures wind direction and wind azimuth and then I'll select OK and then the table that's created here is going to really inform the inputs that I use for my fire spread. Um, I'm mostly interested in the peak conditions, since that's probably what contributed to the large fire growth, but I'm, I'm interested in the range of conditions as well. So what I'm going to do is just include or uh, take a screen capture of this information so that um, I can include it in the notes that I'm taking on uh, the inputs that I'm using so that I can um, start to do some fire modeling. All right, now we're ready to put all this information into FlamApp to try and model some fire spread.